So I'm going to talk about uh, for a few for a bit about um, uh, two separate libraries um, that exist in the Filecoin ecosystem. Uh, they are Go Data Transfer and Go for Markets. Um, this talk is about 100% winged, uh, minus some like uh, assembled resources and whatnot in half parts of old talks. Um, so, uh, so we'll just sort of jump around as needed and kind of hopefully we'll get to somewhere that, that makes sense. Um, uh, first of all, uh, just to like at the highest level, what are these libraries? Um, uh, Filecoin, uh, the concept of a of markets in Filecoin uh, refers to the deal making portion of the system. Um, so this is the process by which people identify um, people to store data with, set things up with them and store their data. Um, and then also how they identify people to retrieve data from and set things up and retrieve their data. Um, uh, Go Data Transfer is a library that sits on top of the underlying uh, protocol for moving data, the underlying protocol in Filecoin is crossing. Um, and Go Data Transfer is sort of like the, the way I've, I've started to talk about it is it's sort of a control plane protocol. Um, concretely, what that means is like Go Data Transfer understands, understands things at a very logical level, of like starting a request, stopping a request, restarting a request, pausing a request authenticating a request. It's a very like high level language for talking about doing a transfer versus the underlying protocol is just a protocol and it has like whatever mechanics it has for interacting with it. Um, and so uh, in, in the overall system of uh, Filecoin, the way this kind of works, if you, let me see if I can make this one a little, I think I can open this in a new window. Does that do that? There we go. Yeah, this is actually a really useful diagram that I can't remember who drew it like forever ago. Um, uh, and there's a few bits that are like kind of off, but like the basic concept of like, you have, when you think about like making deals in Filecoin, um, whether it's a, uh, and, and you you have like here, over here, you have your minor, now we call them a provider. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, I'm gonna go over here. So, so sorry. Loose, yeah. okay. Yay, yeah. yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah, so um, at the moment, um, yeah, this diagram's from a, a, a while ago. Um, so in this case, we have a cl client, someone who wants to store and retrieve data, and, and a miner, and now we call them a provider, who is willing to store or serve up data. Um, and this is sort of like how they talk to each other. Um, you have an underlying, you have an underlying transport for moving data back and forth, and that underlying transport in file plan for the time being is grasping. Um, uh, and then you have a, 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 a module that sits on top of grasping, which is data transfer. And data transfer translates the protocol syntax of grasping into a much more semantic syntax of managing requests. Um, and then on top of that, you have a you have storage deals and retrieval deals. Um, Retrieval deals are primarily a transfer. Storage deals are actually quite a bit more than a transfer. There's a whole bunch of steps involved in storage deals, uh, in addition to moving data from one place to another. Um, but in any case, you have these, these modules that essentially orchestrate the actual um, semantics of storage or retrieval. Um, on the client side, you have a storage client and a retrieval client. And on the storage side, you have a storage provider and a retrieval provider. Um, and what these do probably, and especially in our case, we're gonna be thinking about retrieval. Um, in retrieval, the retrieval client provider are primarily uh, a mechanism for doing, um, for handling payments. Um, so the retrieval client um, uh, talks to the data transfer layer and the retrieval provider talks to the data transfer layer. And essentially they monitor the transfer um, and the provider asks for money um, when a certain amount of bytes are transferred and the client verifies that they've, they've, they've tripped, that they have transferred that number of bytes sort of pre-agreed upon, they send them new money and then, uh, and then the provider resumes the transfer and, and, and sends them more, more data. And you essentially have this like set of incremental payments for incrementally verified data. Um, one of the, it, it, uh, yeah, I'll talk a little bit more about retrieval in a minute because um, that's obviously relevant to what we're going to be doing with the retrieval client. Um, 
the storage provider and the storage client and the storage provider actually do a whole lot more than the transfer itself. Um, the transfer itself in, in the storage market is pretty simple um, because you're just moving data from one place to another and there's no payment involved um, uh, at that point. But the orchestration of setting up a storage deal is actually quite, quite complicated. So there's a number of steps that, it, that are involved in setting up a storage deal and then negotiating it, moving the transfer, putting it on chain uh, because uh, storage deals are on chain. Um, and then the, um, then on the provider side, there's a whole bunch more steps related to, um, uh, relating to sealing data and proving it, which is a whole thing about the file point system. Um, and we, <laughs> we don't necessarily need to know that much about that. Um, so yeah, so that's the kind of like overall architecture. I don't know what this like file and file store is at the beginning. That feels a little out of date to me, but um, but yeah, that's the that's the basic concept. Folks have questions before I go into some more in depth on a few parts. These things sort of make sense. How does the data transfer and graphing know if it needs to use the mark the storage versus the retrieval validator? Yeah, so um, the, the data transfer has, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit in, in a moment about vouchers, how vouchers work. Um, vouchers, uh, we've been, I think, having, I think for a, for a lot of us, we've been thinking about vouchers in terms of payments, but a voucher is, a, uh, actually, let me go, let me go in depth a little bit about data transfer before we go any farther and then get to what vouchers are and then that'll help us get to the answer to that question. Um, so let me talk about go data transfer. Uh, hold on one second. Yeah. What? Yeah, oh, 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 I'm gonna rotate. I'm rotating. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Because I realized the microphone is. Yes. Yes. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's go back over to our. Let's talk about go data transfer. Gosh. So for go data transfer, this is gonna be really interesting because like I don't actually have any notes other than just kind of like me talking about what this thing is. Um. Actually, I think I'll start by talking about what it was, how it originally came to be. Um, the, the the basic concept of Go Data Transfer, when it first was created, and it probably eventually will continue to be something along these lines, is that we um, wanted to do two things in the context of Filecoin. Um, uh, one was like in IPFS, we basically have uh, a system of sending data around that is effectively like completely cooperative and altruistic and potentially vulnerable to someone exploiting it. Um, uh, but though there's mitigation mitigations for that, but like in, in BitSwap, which is the main transfer for, um, uh, for IPFS, you essentially, anyone can ask anyone for blocks and our current heuristic is just send everyone who asks blocks, send, send them blocks back, right? Um, there's no notion of like, authenticating requests, making sure that requests are valid, only accepting requests from certain peers, like all the things you might expect in like a web like application where like you have a logged in section, right? You wouldn't want to respond to server requests unless you get a cookie that, you know, somehow authenticates the request. Um, and so data transfer came about because we knew, it, it initially sort of came about because we knew A, that we were going to have to authenticate request, uh, requests to transfer data in the context of Filecoin um, because we didn't want to just accept, you know, incoming transfers on a miner from anyone. We needed to know they were associated with a storage deal. Similarly, we wanted to make sure that we only sent data on a um, on a client, uh, uh, sorry, in a retrieval deal from a miner when the client was actually paying for it. Um, and then data transfer, and then we also knew that we probably wanted to have an abstract notion of that authentication um, and a general abstract notion of managing a transfer uh, without having to specify the underlying protocol. There was a belief, um, and there probably is still a belief uh, going forward, that we are going to most likely support multiple protocols for transferring data in Filecoin and other you know, protocol products. And we need to have a sort of like protocol independent language for talking about like the stages of moving data around. Um, and so that's kind of what data transfer is intended to be. Um, data transfer is intended to be a, like an abstract control layer for orchestrating a data transfer. Um, Juan, when he initially presented it to me, like 
I think it was like two years ago. <laughs> um, the, the the image he showed, like the image he had in his mind, was like of a you know a download manager you might have in Netflix and or not in Netflix in Netscape. I mean, which obviously I guess would be Chrome now. Um, <laughs> you know, but like this idea of like, oh, you just have like these abstract transfers, except they're not just HTTP. They're like all of our protocols, including like sending things to the mail and like that. I don't know about the sending things to the mail protocol, but that was like the original concept. Um, and we also knew that we wanted to be able to do orchestrate transfers in ways that were that were slightly unusual. Like we wanted to be able to initiate a transfer on the side that was sending data to essentially push data to someone else. There's reasons for that. Um, in the specific case of uh, uh, storage deals, when the client is sending data to a provider, there's a much greater likelihood that the client is behind a VPN. Um, and we're generally going to do a lot better if we initiate the connection from the side that is behind a VPN. Um, so, uh, so data transfer, one of the things data transfer does is it has a push uh, transfer, which essentially uh, you open a push transfer in order to send data to someone. And the way it works under the hood um, is that it actually sends a special message to the other person to initiate the transfer and then the other person um, uh, assuming they authenticate the request actually kicks off a grass sync request from their side to request data back um, so it's kind of this like weird hack way of adding a push mode to 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 grass sync um so uh let's talk about a couple about a couple of data transfer concepts um so I'm going to just pull this up. This is the manager. This is sort of the top level API for a uh, for the data transfer. Um, you can you can start. Uh, you know, there's one data transfer instance uh, per per libp2p host at the moment, um, uh, and you know there it has some like really basic starting and stopping uh, functions. And then the main functions you're going to see are you're going to be able to open a push channel. Uh, open a push channel, open a pull channel. You can be able to close a push uh, channel. You, you can pause it, you can resume it. Um, you can get states about what's going on. Um, uh, you can also subscribe to events. And this basically just gives you an event stream of everything that's happening in different transfers. This is a one per the entire module, which is sometimes problematic because you basically get information about- Do you need to use like the pausing and resuming and Caring about pull versus push and such, like that's a lot of that's a pretty broad and complex interface to manage as someone who's. I mean, you don't need there. There, it depends on what you want to do. You don't need to use pause and resume unless you want to pause and resume transfers. Um, and you don't need to use push and pull unless you need to. I mean, you can only use pull if you just want to fetch data. Um, but but people do need to use push in certain cases. Um, Is one manager per module is that by design? What? One manager per module, is that by design? Uh, it, it is by design in the sense that a data transfer manager is intended to manage all the transfers, right? Mm -hmm. Like you just create a manager and then you can open channels and you can pause them, you can resume them, all get updates on all the different transfers, whatnot. Um, so that is the design. Um, you, why isn't there an individual? Uh, part of the design is motivated by the fact that data transfer does currently have its own libp2p protocol to basically fill in the gaps in graph sync. Um, this is this is a, there's a refactor concept um, in data transfer, which is it probably shouldn't have um, its own. Uh, it probably should not have its own underlying protocol. Um, and if that is the case, uh, that will allow us to potentially have one data one manager per request if we wanted to do that. Um, uh, but because it, it, it might be a two of each with something like on the same lib P2P host, yes, because it, there's a protocol. Every every protocol can only have one handler per host. And that's where you get into like a global handler. Like Graphson can't be initialized twice on the same lib P2P host. Um, and because data transfer right now has its own lib P2P protocol, it cannot be initialized initialized twice. Um, at some point, it probably will be able to be initialized twice because it will be that will be disconnected. Um, the other thing that data transfer like I uh, does like it does some like crazy stuff like it actually persists states of every transfer so that if you shut down your node and you restart, um, 
it should resume the transfers. I believe uh, that that's always like it's always a question mark if that totally works. But like um, you know, the idea is if you're you know you would like it if you're sending 32 gigs of data in a storage deal and you shut down your node for you to be able to like turn it back on and have the transfer complete. Um, and then there's like other conditions that we're trying to deal with um, and data transfer does most of this where like, you know, if a, another peer hangs up in the middle, like, because like, I don't know, like their internet went out for five minutes and then it comes back on, we would like that not to cause everything to fail. So there's that. Um, uh, let me see what else I want to talk about. Oh. Yeah, I want to talk about uh, vouchers, right? So the way the concept of uh, how requests are, in, are authenticated in data transfer is this concept of vouchers. And vouchers, I like a voucher is just an abstract piece of data. It has nothing to do with payment. Um, there's a separate concept in the payment channel world of payment vouchers. But like in this case, you, the way I think of a voucher is it's basically the Web three concept of a cookie. Um, it's just a piece of data that allows you to look at an incoming request and make some decisions about whether to serve it. Um, and basically, the system via which you can have, you can delegate different, uh, like the, the way the system via which you can essentially specify different types of vouchers and how you do, you validate them is you have a concept of voucher types. Um, and basically what you do is your voucher type is literally your construct, right? So like if I have, I have a storage voucher or retrieval voucher um, and uh, I register a voucher type. So I pass here like literally an instance of the storage voucher and an instance of the retrieval voucher. And then I ask, and then I pass it a validator. Um, and basically what this is going to do is when a new request comes in, it's going to look at the, it's going to look at the encoded voucher, it's going to deserialize it um, into this specific type, and then based off the type, it's going to call out to whatever registered validator exists and, um, and, and pass that to that validator. So to answer, will your original question, that is how that happens. Um, Let's see, what else can we say about this? Yeah, and so that's like the, the there's a concept of a voucher type and that's like pretty much all you need for storage. Um, for retrieval, we have to have a bunch, we have to have a bunch more stuff, right? Because with retrieval, what we want to be able to do is we want um, the way retrieval works. And again, this is just the design of retrieval in the, for, you know, in the first version of Filecoin. Um, retrieval has to address a, a problem that I guess in computer science is called fair exchange, which is like, I want to pay you. Um, I want to pay you some amount of money for you to send me some kind of good goods, and I want to be able to do that in some form of trustless way. Trustless way where I can be guaranteed, where both parties can be guaranteed that the other parties can act responsibly. Um, it's a fairly hard problem to solve. Um, there, there, there's no like magic bullet. Um, the solution we use in um, and Filecoin is something that I believe is called optimistic uh, fair exchange, which is that we essentially in a in a in a retrieval we want to send a small piece of data and then request payment and get paid for that, and then you want to complete that process multiple times for the whole thing, and you can and you can slowly increase the amounts of each each uh, individual transfer for payment unit on the theory that people you know once. Once people are behaving well, they're likely to continue behaving well. Um, yes. How the initial size, initial chunk calculated? It's actually part of the the agreement in the deal. So when I propose a deal, I say I want to. There's actually there's like a payment interval and there's a payment interval increase, which is basically saying I want to pay you every X bytes, and then each time I we do a successful round trip, I want to increase that number of bytes by X by Y, right? Yeah. Uh, what if I start a trend, uh, if I request uh, some data and I have enough money for it, but halfway through, for some reason I run out of money, can I like pause it while I get more money? Uh, well, so what's going to happen is it, we, the, the ordering is bytes first, then then payment, right? So the provider is going to send me 10,000 bytes and then they're going to say, you need to pay for that before I send you any more. Um, what's going to end up happening in that case is, you know, let's say you're halfway through and you run out of money. Um, they are going to look at your, um, they're going to send you a request and you're not going to be able to fulfill it, at which point the transfer is yes, indeed paused. Um, because it literally what happens is when they send the vouch voucher, well, the first thing they do is pause the transport. 
right? Um, the other thing though, the, the interesting thing about that is that's a little bit of a, an inch, well, it's an interesting question because uh, one thing that you should know is that you're not actually sending bill back and forth. You're sending this thing called a payment voucher in a, something called a payment channel. There is an entire concept in the world of blockchains um, called payment channels and they're a slightly evolved concept called state channels. And what these are all based on is the idea of like being able to set up, like basically it's like you imagine that like, we're both gonna agree that overall I'm going to trans, I, I'm gonna say over the course of this transfer, I will send you $10, right? And so what I do is I essentially put $10 locked, right? And, uh, and then, uh, and then what I'm and, we, and that's a chain transaction, right? And then once things get going, what's going to happen is I'm going to send you these things called vouchers, which will essentially be these things that you can submit to the chain to actually unlock a portion of the funds that have been put in that escrow. And you don't have to submit them right away. They're set up in such a way that you can submit them whenever. And that's important because um, in the case of retrieval, we actually can't block on a chain, chain transaction for each step of the retrieval. Chain transactions tend to take 30 seconds to a minute if you're lucky. Often like on Filecoin, they're sometimes longer. Um, so, so basically you wanna avoid talking to the chain during the course of a retrieval wherever possible. And you'll ideally wanna avoid the, one, of the, one of the problems with retrieval right now is that you have to set up the initial payment channel um, before you do the retrieval, which itself is a delay. So like that's, that's a problem right now um, in retrieval. Um, in any case, yeah. So how does that actual like pausing and whatnot happen, right? Um, so we have this concept of a concept of a revalidator. <laughs> <laughs> and what the revalidator does um, is they have this, they provide this interface to data transfer. Um, and there's a couple of different methods on it. This method we can ignore for the time being. We have one called on pull data sent, which basically means uh, when I've sent some amount of data, right? Uh, I am, uh, each time more data is about to be sent, right? Um, I have the option to inspect how much data is sent and send an additional voucher result, which is basically additional information back to the client. And I also have the ability to um, pause the request. Um, the pausing is done with a really terrible method right now, the error value, if you return a special error called error pause, it will pause the request. That probably should change. Um, <laughs> so any, in any case, so like, when I, when I register a revalidator, I register this revalidator, where is it? Uh, I register it on the voucher type. So any, any, any request where the initial voucher matches this type is now gonna go to the revalidator. And each time we send data, this method is gonna be called the on pull data sent. And I am going to basically look at that and decide whether I wanna pause the request. And if I do, I probably wanna send a voucher result, which is just gonna be some form of communication back to the other side to say, here's why I paused it. Right. Uh, on the other side, you can call a method called uh, send voucher, which is going to just directly send a voucher to the other side. Um, in this case, what that the way that happens is that um, like the retrieval code is going to look at the information sent back by the provider, and they're going to say, "Oh, they they said to they they said they paused it, and they want us to pay me." Right, and then they're going to send the voucher, and then when they send the voucher, you the revalidator is going to get this method called revalidate with the voucher that was sent, and then they're going to, and then that will allow them to unpause the request when saying that they have received payment. Yes. Why is such a strong emphasis on validating vouchers? Um, I'm used to constant voucher. Uh, what you mentioned about the voucher being cookie built in, as opposed to authenticate or like. Like, like, you mean like why, why an emphasis on like the language or the, or? Validation of the voucher. Yeah. So why is there such a strong emphasis on validating of the voucher like in, at the interface level? Well, cause that is effectively how you control the behavior. It, you, it, like the word validate is probably not the right word um, because you are doing something between authentication and authorization. Um, uh, essentially, it's probably authorization is the closest concept to what you're doing. Um, uh, in the initial request, you're looking at that 
you know, cookie and you're using it to essentially decide who's sending me this thing. Do I believe it's that person? And are they allowed to do the thing that I want that they're going to do? In the in the next uh, stage, you're looking at the voucher and you're saying, what data did I receive? Is it the right data? You know, is it the right data for like what I was requesting? And if so, I'm resuming the request. Uh, so, so, is it a consequence session? Or is, is every time there's a voucher, you validate or authorize it? There is not a concept of it. So if you mean like a session as in each data packet contains the voucher, no, not really. It's not really like a session, but the data transfer itself is a, is a form of a session because it is like a long running thing that lasts between multiple network data packets. Yeah. I think that's maybe that, though it only lasts for the scope of a single transfer. Again, the language here is sort of like made up because we're in a context that like doesn't really completely match the web context, but like also like, you know, like, uh, yeah, in fairness, sorry, I, one piece of history about the data transfer module <laughs> is that it was written like, so like basically there was an initial design and it was all, it was only about storage and it was like, do this. And then there was like a, and one day we'll make it work for retrieval. And then like, they're like, we should, we should make it work for retrieval before Filecoin mainnet ships. Um, and so like, this was like me hacking out an interface completely on my own and uh, with like, and to add another layer to it, like in addition to no feedback, like this got to the point of like, we were, I think at that point in the test net, what was that thing called? The liftoff space race. Yeah. So shit was like happening. We were very close to launch and like the entirety of the current architecture of go data transfer was shipped in a single 6,000 line PR <laughs> written at like 3 a.m. This is like some college coding bullshit, um, like, you know, except that I'm not in college uh, by any means. Uh, and so like, yeah, there's, God, this is the like, of the various designs that I shipped while working at Protocol Labs, this is the one that I'm least excited about. Um, Maybe it's impressive. What? Maybe it's impressive and she can throw the right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Plus or minus. I think right now most of Ignite hates me for these modules. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, I mean, like, it is funny because everyone, like, I feel like Graphsync's the one that people are most like, well, what's going on with Graphsync? This is a problem. But I'm like, Graphsync is like relatively well designed at this point. It's like, you know, tested. It's I, it does a whole lot. I mean, the biggest problem is it's doing a shit ton of stuff, right? Like, um, but uh, but I generally believe in it a little bit more than I believe in data transfer. <laughs> um, uh, let me talk briefly about the architecture of markets. Um, so, and markets, I uh, markets I also have slightly more belief in the in 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 like I actually think it's vaguely reasonable. Um, uh, Markets is like what really market markets are mostly designed around the storage market um, because that was the more complex task. Um, and, and essentially what you're doing with the storage market is you're managing an extremely long running process with lots of stages uh, to that process, lots of different things that happen in each stage and lots of things that can go right or wrong. Um, and so uh, markets is essentially managed by uh, underneath by a state machine. Um, there's a, there's, there's sort of a, actually, let me show you this. Go yeah, go state machine. So go state machine is an interesting one because it's, it has two versions inside of the same, uh, piece of code. Um, one, the original version of this was written by magic. Um, and that's this like root version. And then there's like this sub module called FSM, which I wrote most of. And FSM was like, so magic state machine is super free form. It's like, like, it's basically like you can submit any event and like respond to it in any way. And then like, uh, kind of do anything with it. And you have to write a lot of code to work with it. Um, uh, but I mean, it's very general and in that sense, it's pretty cool. And like, you can do lots of it. And he uses it to super well, good effect inside of the, ceiling system. Uh, the, the FSM that I wrote is sort of taking that and trying to lock it down into much more uh, defined rules around like classic finite state machines. Um, and, uh, you know, what you do with 
And the, essentially the FSM adds like a whole DSL for like defining like, you know, events that happen and what states can happen out of them and what, what you know, what transitions they cause and all that type of stuff. Um, and uh, which is like pretty cool and, and super easy to use, but at the same time, like, I don't know, it's an interesting, this is an interesting trade-off with like Magic Sync because Magic Sync is really simple. Um, and this thing is more like, this is this is definitely written by a former Rails programmer, where it's like very convention over configuration, DSL everything, and like, um, so yeah. So there's that. Um, yeah, and like it has a bunch of like so like if you look and what the the type of stuff that that it generates. If you look in if you look in film markets, there's a bunch of folders, but the core folders are storage market and retrieval market. Um, and in, inside of each storage uh, market, you're gonna have a bunch of interfaces at the top. You're gonna have an impl directory in the tradition of someone who was also a Java programmer at one point. Um, and then you're going to have, uh, what are we, are provider states and client states, right? So this is like the client state machine. Um, and uh, you get this, like, this is the FSM for the client. Um, it's a very, like, dsl like, language for dividing things to happen. You know, you start in the, when you get the open event, you go from unknown to, like, the very first stage, which is reserving the client funds. And then, like, you, there's, like, lots and lots and lots and lots of things that have to happen. Like, it's a very long process with lots of stages. Um, and the when you enter one of the core concepts in the state machine is that when you enter a state, you can kick off a function that's sort of like an asynchronous, like now I'm in this state, I will do stuff um, uh, to potentially transition into the next state, um, which is like something that you want to do. Like you enter, a, you submit a chain transaction, you enter the waiting for that chain transaction to be done and state, and the function you kick off is something that watches the chain and sees if the transaction is done and then fires a, you know, transaction is done event and that triggers the state transition to the next state. Um, and you have those, so you'll have, what you'll see is you'll have the FSM defined there and then you're gonna have this other, this other file that's gonna have all of the functions you do that like are asynchronous and, and wait for things to happen. Um, and that's the basic structure of markets. Um, I, uh, part of this is written heavily towards like allowing testing of these functions in particular. Um, one of the things that for better or worse, I was really invested in like actually testing these asynchronous functions and making sure that like given this, given you start here and you run this function and like these things happen, you should end up in this state, right? Um, so that's, that's, a, that's a thing that, that happens here. Um, and so you have like, these like client state tests that test each one and run through it. Um, which is both cool and from what I hear, slightly annoying because uh, sometimes there's a lot of indirection happening um, because again, like things are set up to be very unit testable. Um, let's see. So that's the basic architecture of it. Um, so just to give you a sense of like what the overall path looks like, uh, I'm gonna see if I can pull this up. Uh, da -da 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 -da. Let's see, where is it? Let's go to the home. Let's go to the spec. Let's see if we can go to the storage market. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, here it is. These are all the things that happen in a storage deal. And even then it's still not, uh, there we go. Can I scroll up? No, I don't want to uh, just scroll. Is this derived from the finite section? Uh, no, it is not. If you want to see the actual finite state machine, that was what I was showing you guys earlier. Uh, oh, I, I moved off of it. Oh, here we go. Yeah, here is the finite state machine for the storage client. As you can see, there's a lot of things that can happen. And one thing you might say is that this is too complicated to be a single finite state machine. But as with most finite state machines, you start out thinking, oh yeah, there's X number of states. And, and this is, the one thing that's nice about this, this is auto-generated from the code. So like, yeah, it does stay up to date. Um, and you can't, I think you can't ship a PR without running the update task. Um, unfortunately, it does get, you know, diagrams are only useful below a certain level of complexity. <laughs> so, you know, um, but you can at least follow things. And according to my former coworker, when he was working in the code, he referred to this a lot um, to help him understand what was happening. Uh, yeah, and those are auto generated. And then, but yeah, so this is the actual process of like doing mining. Um, you got to, I mean, of doing a deal. You gotta find someone, you gotta find out how much they're charging, you gotta start a deal, 
um, which means the way storage deals work is that, like there's essentially like an escrow account for everyone. And like everybody has to put money into that escrow account before you can even do the deal. And that's like a, that's a chain transaction. So the first thing you do is do all that escrow work on the client, then you propose it. And then the storage provider essentially responds saying, I intend to accept your deal if you provide me with the remaining, you know, with the data properly. Uh, then you send a... What did data transfer must have gotten taken off of this? Oh, no, no, no. Uh, oh, right. This is like the what the miner has to do. They have to look at all your, pro your proposed parameters, decide if it's going to work. And then if they do, they indicate they're going to, their intent to accept it. Then you have to do all the transferring of data. The miner has to put their own money into the actor. They need to verify the data that you sent them exactly matches the proposal you made because they're going to have to prove uh, when you do a deal in Filecoin, you actually have to prove that you have the exact data that was proposed to be sent. Uh, there's this notion of a piece commitment that is essentially like a hash of some version of your data. Um, and so basically they have to verify that the data you sent them exactly matches this, this piece commitment before they do anything with the deal. Then they have to put the deal on chain. That's called publishing. Once they publish the deal, they let you know that the deal has been published. The client probably wants to verify that it exists on chain. And then there's like a whole like handoff to this other system for sealing and proving the data, which is the, the sort of final part of the market. Yeah, go ahead. The word actor is unrelated to actor system. It is, yes, sorry. Um, the, the, uh, the word actor uh, in this case, an actor is a um, it's a system within the Filecoin virtual machine, which so I guess sorry it's slightly similar in the sense that when you think about um, so the Filecoin the Filecoin chain essentially has a, a programming logic to it. It's, it has a set of built-in smart contracts. You can think of it as like it doesn't have the ability to program general ones, but it has a, a set of different things that can do different different people who can do different things in the system, right? And everybody who is in the Filecoin chain is considered an actor, every, even including every wallet is technically an actor. Um, uh, but there's some built-in actors that have predefined logic to them. There's something called the storage market actor, the storage minor actor, there's a few more, there's the payment channel actor. And these are basically just sets of code that you can send messages to the chain and they know how to process them based off of the, the, the fact that it was directed towards them. Um, and uh, yeah, in that sense, I guess it's sort of like an actor in the sense that like, you know, you send it a message and it processes it and produces a result, um, but it is not, it's not, it's not a, it's not an actor model in that sense. Yeah. No, no, I, I guess not. I guess, the, no, they have access to a lot of data from the other people, I think. Yeah, so in any case, that's like the concept there. Yeah, that term does get overloaded though, because like I, I've heard that more than once where I've talked about chain actors in Filecoin and someone who has the sort of like actor model background. It's like- Because you talk about that stuff, right? And you, you talk about the transaction, which to me, you might say actor model. Yes. And, and, yeah, yeah, no, totally. And it, that is not the case here. Also like the FSM we're talking about is an off-chain FSM. This is the FSM in the markets module, which is coordinating the whole process. It's supposed to an on-chain FSM, which would be like a state of the storage market actor, which is this on-chain actor. Markets is, a, is so markets is really interesting in that like, well, particularly for um, re in retrieval, almost everything is off the chain. And then in storage, there are things that are on chain, but there's lots of things that happen off chain, right? You have to send uh, like, you have like, um, Sorry, uh, you have like, uh, you know, you have to transfer data and the transferring of data actually has nothing to do with the Filecoin chain, right? Like, uh, and so, so the, and, and, you know, generally they try to keep as much stuff off chain as possible. So you have this interesting orchestration between doing things that are on, the need to be happen on chain and then doing a bunch of other things that happen off chain and you have to like orchestrate all that together. And that's largely what the markets module does. So yeah, I've been wondering uh, how come a uh, few markets is not part of Lotus. Uh, what's the history there? Is there yeah. any other time using it? Uh, that has to do originally with the notion of two implementations. Like that is the actual historical. Like because like uh, fun fact about the development of like Filecoin. There was another. There was an, an original implementation that was called Go Filecoin, 
And then there, and then there was Lotus, and Lotus re largely replaced Go Filecoin. Um, it, for a long time, there was an intention. There was an intention to ship at launch two different implementations of Filecoin, Go Filecoin and Lotus, um, which was a little weird because they were both going to be in the same language. And like the whole idea was, if you ship multiple implementations, you reduce risk. Um, it also got really confused because we, at some point, they were all going to share spec actors, which is the actual on-chain module that is like by far the most security <laughs> uh, security relevant thing. And so if they were sharing that, it kind of obviated the point. Because of that, the idea was that there'd be these two implementations, but they would share code that was not considered like high risk for security. And GoFill Markets was considered one of those. So the idea was they were both going to use GoFill Markets. Um, and I believe they both they both did. Uh, at some point, Go Filecoin uh, got removed as a PL project to have it launch. It actually got taken over by, I believe, IPFS Force. Yeah, and then and then that is the thing that's now called Venus. Um, yeah. Why to to begin? To sure. I, this is like a, it's an ongoing thing in in like uh, in for for blockchains uh, is to to have multiple implementations on the theory that um, so like Ethereum has what is it Geth and there's one other one yeah 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 they, well, sorry they have they now they have lots but there was it, I think at launch they already had two um, and like the input the idea is that that one way to prevent to to remove risk is that like. If you have two implementations, the odds that both have the exact same security issue are lower. Um, and so in a worst case scenario where a security issue comes up, it uh, you can kind of fall back to the other one. And Ethereum's actually done that a couple of times, I believe. Exactly. Uh, yeah, no, 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 no. So, the, so the, the, that would... Yeah. There are, yeah. There's a Rust implementation that I believe is about to go live and a C++ oh, yeah, implementation. It's, it's right. Yeah. Their line is just what, which, which migrations they're keeping up with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, also, there's a C++ implementation, though. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, to be, but I mean, not to editorialize too much, but like the notion of using the two Go implementations as like that to solve that problem seemed, always seemed pretty odd to me. Um, and then also, the notion of, but, and then at some point they were going to actually share the code that ran in the chain, the actors. And so then it's like, what's the point at all? It was a weird, God, it, let's just say that there were more, more, there were, there were levels of, of, of uh, there were issues I think that motivated that, that maybe went beyond the software. Um, and that's literally all I will say about that. <laughs> maybe this is a good, yeah, that's a good point to stop. Yeah.